this I do my kingdom very well. Yeah. Okay. For those of you that have been trying to follow the agenda, we're now at the start. <laughs> the uh, the agenda had Dave making welcoming remarks and then Carl and I making some remarks. Uh, but uh, I think it's an honor to be uh, blessed by the best speaker ever and the best Secretary of Labor in a generation that uh, come and address us. And I do want to take a brief liberty because I waited so long that, uh, and I may offend some management in the room and I apologize for that, but at least you'll know where I stand. I, uh, I couldn't help but think of my upbringing while well, Secretary Solis was talking about occupational health and safety. I'm the son of a union miner and I grew up in a small mining community in northern Ontario in Canada. And I lived in a company house, went to the company sponsored school and had to see the company doctor while my dad had to buy his mining supplies at the company store. And as I was growing up in grade school and you heard the mine whistles go off, you got to know what those mine whistles for and what shift changes they were for. And then when they went off at a time that they weren't supposed to, you knew something had happened in the mine. And you'd end up wondering whether, did I see dad this morning before I went to school? Was he night shift or day shift? Uh, what's my buddy Larry's uh, father working at? What shift is he on? I can tell you that the last uh, month, has certainly driven it home to not just me, but I hope to everybody in this room, the importance of occupational health and safety and its impact on the environment. Because whatever happens in the workplace, whatever happens in the workplace eventually makes it out into the common space. In the petroleum industry so far this year, we've had almost one explosion a month. I mean, one explosion a week. If it was one explosion a month, that would have been fewer. In the mining industry, we just saw what happened. I can tell you this, and I feel this in my gut, and everybody that cares about working people ought to feel it as well. If you're running a mine where you're supposed to put in fresh air and exhaust bad air, and if that mine plan should call for 200,000 cubic feet per minute, and you're putting in 30,000 cubic feet per minute, there is no difference between that and someone that goes to a bar and gets drunk, jumps in their car and on their way home, runs over some family and kills one of the parents or kills the parent and the kid. If that happens, society will demand that that individual be charged with criminal negligence. Well, when you do that in a mine, when you do that in the mine, you should get charged no less than that person who drank because you're risking someone else's life. And I think that to me, that ranks along with what we're doing on the environment. And I can tell you this, I've been asked many times over the last eight or nine years, what the hell are the steel workers doing in this? And for many folks, they don't understand we're not Johnny come lately's. Along with the Sierra Club, almost 40 years ago, our union helped pass the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Our union held its first, our union held its first, in those days we called it anti-pollution conference in 1963. Because we knew then that what our members were breathing in those plants was making it into our communities. And anyone that knows the history of the labor movement, most of our industrial communities were attached to an industry, whether it was a steel town, a mining town, an auto town, a chemical town, paper town, we were all attached to the industry in that town. And very often we shared the same water supply as the, as the industry. 
we certainly breathed the same air. I can remember in my hometown, it was the pollution capital of the world. The Apollo astronauts went to practice landing in the moon in my damn backyard almost. <laughs> you know, you couldn't find a tree. And our union went to bat and said, this is not acceptable. And we fought for the regreening of not just those towns, but the whole region. We fought to clean up those workplaces. We fought to get the toxins out of the plants. We fought for better smelting methods. Because we knew almost 50 years ago now that that was the future. In 1990, our union passed a document at the most raucous convention I've been at where our president was stormed at the microphone by our own members because we passed a document called Our Children's World. And in 1990, we called for the cleaning up of the environment. In 1990, we said, and think about this, what other organizations other than the Sierra Club and maybe one or two others said in 1990 that global warming is going to be the most important issue going forward for the next generation. In 1990, we were saying that global warming was the issue of crisis already. And I want to pay compliment to Dave Foster, who as a member of our board, chaired our committee on the environment in 2005, and we updated our document and we called it Securing Our Children's World. Because our generation has a responsibility to the next generation. And then sitting here with Carl, I remembered, and I actually brought with me a document that on June the 7th, 2006, we signed. And we talked about in the a number of whereases. We talked about the times we had worked together, and Carl once put it very eloquently uh, that the steelworkers and the Sierra Club had been actually dating each other, but we only did it at night when no one could see us. Now we were coming, <laughs> now, now we were coming out into the open. And in uh, June the 7th of 2006, Dave Foster was going to be named the executive director, and Carl Pope on behalf of the Sierra Club and I on behalf of the Steelworkers signed a document forming uh, a resolution, the formation of the Blue-Green Alliance. And I laugh because in that meeting there was me and Dave Carl, each of our press people, and I think six others that showed up. And uh, I think it would be on a scale uh, where it would be a toss-up between which times I got the most hate mail as the President of the Union. Uh, when we publicized that we had formed the Blue-Green Alliance in uh, 2006, the hate mail both email and hard mail started pouring in. And the neat thing about being the president, you can assign it to someone else to answer it. <laughs> but we believe then and we believe now that we're heading in the right direction. And I, I can't begin to tell you the amount of pride I'm sure that Carl and I both feel that today the Blue-Green Alliance, an idea that we believed in, uh, is now representing 8.2 million members, both in the labor movement and the environmental movement. And we all ought to be very proud because with Dave's leadership and Carl's leadership, we've built a movement, not just an organization, but we've built a movement. And this movement is going to be the engine that drives the change that's going to create the good jobs for the next generation. I mean, look around at yourselves. There aren't many people in this room under 30. There's way more than there normally is at a labor environmental organization, though, by the way. But if you look around, our generation, our generation is either the generation that's going to leave the worst mess in history or the generation that's going to leave the most opportunity in history. I want it to be the second one. And I can tell you that we've, de we've decided a long time ago that we can lead by example. The Sierra Club and the Steelworkers joined together in something that in many ways caught everyone by surprise. We joined together in trade cases on illegal logging. Uh, 